I have myself tried to haul my ass up a pole. And I know how hard it is to take this 182 pounds up and try to do the split and try to boom my leg and boom, boom, boom. <laughs> An audience needs to understand from the inside how hard this is so that they can respect it even more. I've read that when you looked at Pussy Valley on the stage, uh, because it was a stage play first, yes. you recognized that that maybe its true form was as a TV show. Absolutely. What did the process of making that TV show a reality look like for you? Wow. First, it was embracing the fact that the play had failed. <laughs> no, 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 that was not my implication. No, 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 that's, that's okay. Okay. It's good. Failure clear. leads to information, failure leads to the light. So obviously, you know, a light bulb kind of went off in my head when I saw it and I was just like, oh my God, there's too much going on. There's too many, the, the characters, I want to spend like years with them, not just two and a half hours. Oh my God. Same. Yeah. Same. You know what I mean? Like I want to be in Uncle Clifford's, you know, I want Uncle Clifford to be in my living room for as many years as he possibly can. Yes. So that being said, I luckily had an inkling before the play went up and I had already reached out to a producer who actually flew in to Minneapolis. Uh, it premiered in 2015 at Mixed Blood Theater in Minneapolis. And he saw the play. And I would say within a few months, I was making the rounds in LA doing the whole pitch, you know, thing where yeah. you know, you could lay out what you what you want to do, what you think the the series is going to be. I luckily, you know, really had an idea about, you know, how it could spin out beyond just the play. As a matter of fact, I just saw you know, I just pulled the characters out, but created whole new situations. Booty battle rules. DJ Nasca gonna get each bitch two minutes to turn up. After that, you exit stage left. Winner wins 50 ducats and a hot plate. Any questions? Oh, good. Now get bitch your name. And you best not say no Alizé, cause last bitch that came in here with that name. Mm -mm. Oh, let me think on that then. Next. <laughs> Squawberry. Squawberry? Mm-hmm. My name, Blue Cinnamon. <laughs> now, where they do that at? But at the end of it, only one organization, one company stepped up to the plate, and that was STARS. So I always say all you need is one yes. And I took my yes and crashed through the door. And thank God, um, you know, it was it was it was the right yes. Not only do you exactly. need a yes, you need the right yes. And right. I really feel as though the show was at the perfect place in terms of them um, really allowing their showrunners, particularly their female showrunners, to actually showrun. It wasn't a thing. It's was like, oh, let's put some white guy to be. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Over you. <laughs> yeah. It's your idea. You're running the show. And so, you know, um, but what was super tricky was that it did take me time to figure out what the, the TV version was. So I actually had three writers running. I had like a a mini room which was 10 right. weeks and then I had you know an, another <laughs> room and then they were like okay you need to do a pilot presentation and I'm like what is that 10-15 minutes where I rejiggered the pilot and made it you know super um concise and succinct oh, yeah. and then I had another writer's room after that so it's been a long haul it's been like four to it was a four to five year development process right so that's how we got the show on the air how did you find this cast they're oh, unbelievable I love talking about the casting process because i am so invested in authenticity and i'm so invested in also giving people uh opportunities like you know i got my shot and so i'm like let me give other people their shot so luckily uncle clifford played by nico Anand. Like Nico's been with it from page one. I, I had five pages and I said, Nico, read this. Oh and like in my little Hell's Kitchen apartment, he would come over and read my hot pages straight oh off the press. God. 
And just, you know, it, it allowed me to write an Uncle Clifford that always felt fully realized because I was literally kind of tailoring it to a specific actor. Sorry, I'm sorry. Honey, I'm trying to get you blint for the gods, but I think a ton of this derm blink gonna cover up all this ugly. I don't know why y'all have just let these niggas just fuck with your money like this. No, we do it. Think you could tell me what to do with my money. Girl, hey, this is your money. Right here. Right here, this is your strength. You let a nigga take this away from you, I don't know what you gonna do. But what was really interesting was that he too still had to go through an audition process just because that's, you know, what, what networks want. Yeah, 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 yeah. It is what it is. But through that process, I ended up finding, you know, Brandy Evans, who plays Mercedes, who was just like, you know, uh, a breath of fresh air. And it's, it's almost like the part was written for her. It's almost like she took the Mercedes that was in my mind and just stepped into her skin. Mm-hmm. What was so interesting was that, you know, we had a casting director who she had submitted to and that submission never got to us and so she ended up having to she had she was friends with Patrick Ian Polk who's one of our co-EPs and he kind of flagged oh there's this um, dancer actress named Brandy Evans who wants to audition and I was like sure and when I saw her tape I was like there's great potential here it's so funny I was actually looking through my old casting pages and I remember circling a big old like with head, <laughs> her face with like um, a heart around it like, <laughs> the bad bitch party Invitation only to the top 20 twerkers. Well, bless your thotty little hearts. Y'all know what happened at parties like this? We should be free to express our sexual freedom without patriarchal consequence of rape, rumor, Taylor, or- fuck y'all feminism. You don't want no stuff out there on the internet about y'all that look like this. Point blank, period. You do. And then with Ellarica, that was a really hard one because we have to expand the pool and we went worldwide. I mean, we were going worldwide. Oh, yeah, anyway, yeah, yeah. But yeah. like, it was one of those things like she literally auditioned via Skype uh, at that time because at that time there was no Zoom because there wasn't a pandemic. <laughs> so via Skype, she she auditioned. And that's how we found her. We just, we just saw that, oh my gosh, she, she just oozes this mysterious care oh, God, yeah. out of night. So it, it was such a beautiful process because I find that I learned about my work when an actor kind of puts their the words on their tongue. And it was a long audition process. It almost like we started auditioning at the beginning of 2018. And then we did the pilot presentation in the fall of 2018. And we didn't go back until spring of 2019 for the actual production. Oh, production. Wow. I had read that about Nico. And, and it's so interesting that he was just, he was getting the pages as you were writing them. Was that then sort of a collaboration process to fully realize Uncle Clifford? Uh, having him there the entire time. Initially, Uncle Clifford started out as a, a trans woman. And then over time, you know, uh, Uncle Clifford shifted to someone who is non-binary, but uses and prefers the, the she and her pronouns. Right. And it was through this investigation um, with Nico where we just really felt that Uncle Clifford was feminine and masculine in in equal measure. And it's almost like undefinable. We still, to this day, we <laughs> we send each other pictures. <laughs> like, do you think Uncle Clifford would wear this? Do you think Uncle Clifford would like this lipstick? Oh, I think she would. There's so much of Nico in Uncle Clifford. Nico himself is just such a nurturing being. Even the cast kind of like, you know, jokingly, like you are like really, truly our Uncle Clifford. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. You know, just swooping in and giving the right uh, piece of advice at the right time. So it was a super blessing to have had Nico on the ride from the beginning. As a matter of fact, I don't even think the show would have been greenlit had Nico not have shown our executives who Uncle Clifford is. I think on the page, if you are not connected to Black queer folk, you may not imagine who Uncle Clifford could be in a way that's grounded. And so when Nico just stepped in during that audition process, stepped in front of the camera, you know, I remember at the time the star's president being like, oh, I didn't know that we were going to be able to find this person to play this role. But boom, we we have Nico, Uncle Clifford exists. And right. it felt so much more confident that the show was going to land in a, in a grounded way. I don't need to talk to him. No, when I got somebody else to see me like talking to. Now I'm gonna need you to use them lips. 
And I'll leave it up to you to decide what set you're going to use. You are not my pimp. Oh, but I am your employer with a fake-ass ID in my hand. Now, unless you don't want me to call the sheriff, let him know about the little fraud game you probably running. I suggest you do as I say. One of the things about the show is that it, it's honestly one of the most visually stunning, orally satisfying on television. What did building your team of crafts people look like? It's a, a huge, diverse body of people, you know, from my writer's room. It's funny, I was, I was running through the percentages and I was like, oh, it's mostly women. It's mostly people of color. It is mostly queer. Like the blueprints that we were giving over to our crafts people um, just had, you could tell that there was just like a, a lot of different no, types of hands um, on on the wheel. It, it was my first time running a show. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I had to rely on the team that um, my, my producers, line producer to kind of present me with, you know, who the right post producer might be, who the um, right production designer might be, getting recommendations from them and going through a very intensive interview process where I had such a clear vision and was able to kind of like download into them like the things that I wanted to do in terms of the aesthetic, this Delta Noir aesthetic that I was really striving for. And I just really lucked out and found some really great creative partners over the course of, um, you know, that, that, that prep period. Right. I'm moving into the second season with, you know, the same production designer, some of the, the same co-EPs, mm -hmm. um, some, the same hair team, the same costume team, just very, very blessed to have from jump really connected with a group of people who really respected the vision and really wanted to have the same workflow um, that I wanted, which was one of like deep collaboration. Like I always wanted us to feel as though we're this cohesive unit. And I always, everybody on the set is a filmmaker. If you're a PA, you're a filmmaker. If you are running to go get people coffee, you're a filmmaker. Of course, production designer, you're a filmmaker, director, you're a filmmaker, but it takes all of us. It literally takes a village to get this show up and right. running. There's a moment that recurs throughout in which uh, the audience's point of view becomes fully centered on the woman on the, on the pole. Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. what we hear is her. Yes. We hear her panting and straining and working. Where did that motif come from? And how did you yeah. implement it? So I always was adamant that we got to always show the grit beneath the glitter, the shit beneath the shine. And that extended to the, the actual physical exertion. I must say, had I not taken pole classes myself, <laughs> I probably would not have thought to, you know, let an audience in on the work because that shows, you know, that, you know, there's a kind of humanity there, okay. right? Yeah. Um, but because I have myself tried to haul my ass up a pole and I know <laughs> how hard it is to take this 182 pounds up and try to do the split and try to put my leg and boom, boom, boom. <laughs> I was like, I, an audience needs to understand from the inside how hard this is so that they can respect it even more. So very easy to be wowed by the spectacle and embrace the spectacle and just you know that that's awesome that's cool I, the glitter is important but to understand how you do have to grit your teeth sometimes to get to the top of the pole and for me it's just a metaphor for being a woman in this world point blank period and to be able to do it and to do it with style to the point where it feels as though you're crashing through the sky. My own kind of experience obviously inspired me to make sure that when we kind of lensed it and, and put it in front of an audience that we use this idea of the subjective experience, this idea of the female gaze to really put the audience up on the pole with our characters and also maybe even inside of their POV. Like we were able to do it, you know, a couple of times over the first season and hopefully we'll continue to do it in the second season. That female gaze is the phrase du jour around this show because of the 
the female directors talk about why that was so important to you like I can guess but like I want to I want to hear your take on it it was so important to me because I have seen the male gazy version <laughs> of the strip club yeah. I have seen the version where a woman truly is just T and A I've seen the version where she is wallpaper you know she's truly an object of desire instead of a subject worthy of exploration. And so as a woman walking in this world, knowing that my particular lived experience oftentimes does not get an opportunity to be seen in such a nuanced way, I knew that I had to do it for these women because they've often been so misrepresented and misunderstood. Mm -hmm. So it, it was like this feeling of a great responsibility that I placed upon myself, especially mm -hmm. because they were so human to me. I spent six years researching this. I have been in club after club after club house after house after house, sitting down, breaking bread with these women. I celebrated my 30th birthday, you know, in the back of a strip club, not at, not, you know, on the main floor, but like in the locker room with, oh my God, it's a, such an interesting, you know, uh, crossing over uh, a new threshold for me. And that's where right. I celebrated it. And that's where, you know, I saw this sisterhood oh. between all of these women. Now, let's be honest, like sisters fight, <laughs> you know, yeah. sisters ain't perfect. And I appreciated how kind of open they were about their imperfections. And I just felt like this is so worthy and so deserving of exploration in a nuanced and deep way. I just kind of put it on my shoulders to do it. Like it's, it's taken me 10 years to do this project, to bring it to TV from the idea, the inception of it, from researching it, the, the play version, developing it into a TV show. It, finally being put out on the air like 10 years it's been an odyssey but it's been an odyssey well worth it like I I kid all the time like you ain't gotta pay me to do this I could do this all day no don't all say that day. don't tell them that don't I will take you up on that but uh <laughs> I won't <laughs> all day because I just feel like we're doing something so special and you know allowing not even allowing it's like affirming these women affirming their strength, their stories, their voice, and their importance uh, when it comes to just strip club culture and just, you know, they're human beings and they just deserve their stories to be told. Some days, it's hard living at all. No, ain't never that bad, baby. Whatever make you feel like that, give it the job. That's why I learned this little life of mine. Bones meant to be put in that grave. You're lucky. You get to be with her again. What I know of the South is is what I've seen in TV and movies. Mm -hmm. Tell me about your South and why it was so important to capture that on screen. My South is so warm. My South is loud and theatrical. My South is poignant. My South is funny. I think that there has been this kind of historical representation of the South just being kind of like backwoods, backwards, everybody races, ain't no people who are like not black or white there. And I just know that not to be true, but you know, a Southern gal. Another thing is that often the South is kind of lensed from a perspective of the past there's never this kind of standing in a contemporary South that yes, you know, is cognizant of the past, right. but is firmly planted in not only a present, but a future. I feel as though this kind of contemporary and what I, and dare I say new South, um, that that's a kind of phrase that's going around, right. um, just kind of shows that there's, there's, there's this push forward. Like, you know, I just moved to Georgia and the fact that this particular state, which used to be so red, flipped blue. And there's there's a lot of pro, quote unquote progressive pockets all yeah. over the South. And I think um, people need to understand that the South is more of a melting pot than it has usually been presented as in the media. What P Valley does is it not only um, from a black perspective specifically, you know, shows the diversity within the black experience, but it also kind of 
um, just shows that we are so, so well aware and so connected to the world that is even, you know, out, outside of the South. Um, so just really proud that we've been able to do that as well with the show. They're working downstairs. They're building me a gym. Hopefully I'll put up a poll. Oh my God. If you do. <laughs> Let me ask you season two, where are we at? When do I get more? Please tell me it won't take five years. It's not gonna take five, but it might take two. Okay. Uh, I can, I but, can, you know, I can work with that. We gotta wait uh, for things that are marinated and good. But you know, uh, we're in the process of finishing up the writing. As a matter of fact, today is our last day in the writer's room. <laughs> Yeah, so, you know, finishing up the last scripts and production is around the corner, just overjoyed to be back down here in Atlanta um, to give you guys a second season. <laughs> Autumn Night, how much was that name a setup for a Summer's Eve joke at some point? It wasn't, it wasn't. I was just like, that's her name. And then Alka Clifford got her oh tongue my God. and just came up with everything else. <laughs> It was beautiful. We got some the out this season. <laughs> Thank you so much, Katori. Uh, the the show is is honestly a triumph. All right. Good luck with the poll. Ah, yes, good luck because last real. was not successful. <laughs> I believe in you. Thank you so much. Cool. All Let's right. See you. Bye. Bye.